when Noemi arrives by train to her destination, a man who works for the estate is there to pick her up. And Noemi, upon seeing this man for the first time, remarks at how absolutely pale he is, um, <laughs> as if she, as if he had never seen the sun. She's like, <laughs> "What? What is wrong with him? Like, it's how even be this?" <laughs> So funny. Like, it's just like, are you okay? Like, it's very, it's hilarious. And it was at that moment that it like dawned on me that Noemi isn't white. Like, of course I knew she wasn't, but I had been so used to like doing the work on my own and swapping the identity of the characters to fit my experience that it struck me to realize that I didn't have to do that already. <laughs> like Noemi already looked like me. Hi, I'm Kat. And I'm Gabe. And, and we're, we're the Ghouls Next, next door. door. Talking about spooky stuff. Talking about spooky stuff. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're the, the media literacy show from a horror lens where we talk the real life, historical, uh, psychological, and bibliographical <laughs> reasonings behind our cinematic fears. Uh, and in this series, our written fears, because uh, we're talking about writers. The thing that I want to say about Sylvia, I need to get on her level because she's like one, just like really interesting, but also super impressive. Um, and I mean, she does have like 11 years on me. So mm -hmm. I can still do it. You know, you could still do it. We could, we could still do it. But they're like yeah. really impressive. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, dang, we really got to make make this stuff do. You know, it's got to write like we're running out of time. Just write forever. Just do always. Never do other things. Always write because uh, you could just do the bills with this. That's what she's doing. It's crazy. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. She's super interesting. I'm really excited to say words about her. So. Excellent. Yeah. Do I, it. um, <laughs> yeah, I think she's an inspiration talking about Sylvia Moreno Garcia and, um, also just like she's written so many things are all very different. So I'm going <laughs> to talk about all of that, but it just like writing the script for this made me really excited to like keep reading. Like mm -hmm. I'm reading a really good book right now, but I'm like, I just want to read everything. Like every single one of her stories is so unique. And I'm like, what? And this one? <laughs> when when yeah. did I read that one? Yeah. Can all I ever be doing is reading? For it's real, like, though. <laughs> like, at the, the, the Twilight Zone episode, where it's, like, the end of the world, and the guy's like, okay, I'm going to read. Like, he's the last person on Earth. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I'm in the library, but then his glasses break. Like, he can't go find another pair of glasses. But uh, <laughs> I don't have that problem, so I just read. <laughs> yeah. If anything, every time we've done one of these, I'm like, wow, I wasted so much time not doing, you know, like not reading specifically, like every single one of them loved reading so much. And that's like, I think my biggest problem is that I don't read enough. I only read like internet articles, which are probably not as good as like whole books. So now that's I'm like reading depressing. books. <laughs> yeah, that's so real. I used to read like exclusively nonfiction. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it was super depressing. Um, but I just need to get on the reading game. And these are some dope books. So well, at least we started somewhere good. Like if I was gonna start with anything, I'm glad I started with like this collection. Yeah. Um these writers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was uh when I was like looking up all the different books, because all of her books are on my TBR on Goodreads. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at like I have been a member of Goodreads since 2012. So I was looking at like what did 2012 gave review or read? And it was, it's so funny to see like those books um, and how different, <laughs> like you were saying, like your taste and, and things were. And then I was also looking and thinking like how different it would be if I had had a writer like Sylvia Moreno Garcia available to me as mm -hmm. a young <laughs> Latina person, like growing up, like to have those same fantastical worlds that I was reading about, but they were just like, 
already for me Mm -hmm. (laughs) in a different way, you know, like, um, and so, yeah, I was like looking and I was just like, oh, I remember that series. I remember this thing. Like they were fantastical things. Um, and I remember kind of the work that you have to do mentally to fit yourself into certain molds. And I don't Mm -hmm. have to do that with Sylvia. So (laughs) I was really grateful for that. Yeah, no, for sure. And they're like, they just write in like every genre. So they're creating that space for a lot of people across genres, which is really mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't you tell us about Sylvia Moreno Garcia? Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So, as I did with NK, I have some fun facts. Uh, one thing I'll put a note after I give little fun facts, but it's like hard to find stuff about alive people. Um, yeah. I want them to stay alive and keep being alive for a very long time. But it's like doing biography stuff is like, unless they've written one. You look for, it's just interviews, and it's cool. But uh, they have some fun facts. Uh, big one being that they are the same age as N.K. Jemison. They're only 41. They're so yeah. young as heck. Um, and such a baby face. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, like, their career is just beginning. Like, they're, I mean, they already did, like, a ton of stuff. But, like, they're going to just keep doing awesome stuff, which is cool. Um, they have a really interesting educational background. Specifically, they have a master's degree in science and technology studies from the University of British Columbia. Specifically, they wrote their thesis on eugenics, women, and the work of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, That's amazing. Which is just fascinating. Like, just so cool. Like, not the <laughs> eugenics sucks, but like, yeah. it's very interesting <laughs> that, like, they just have, like, all this knowledge and then, like, this all this knowledge is now being, like, channeled into fiction. Mm-hmm. And like worlds so that like people can like kind of learn about them in a creative way instead of like by reading a ton of nonfiction. And I just think that's pretty cool. Um, they don't just stick to one genre. They might write many different genres. And the reason for that is funny and I'll get into that, but it's really like they need to make money to make life good and they'll write whatever does that. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And also there's like their whole thing is that they read a ton of stuff. So they read from all different kinds of genres. So like they really have the knowledge to write in all different kinds of genres and do so, which is cool. Um, one of their books has a really cool playlist called Signals to Noise. Uh, it's a book that they wrote in 2015 and it has like a cool playlist filled with fun music. So yeah, also recommend and I'll picking that up. Why? <laughs> oh, cool. nice nice i didn't get the why i was just like it's cool that that exists um yeah. <laughs> so just as a general note alive and fairly young people don't always have a ton of information out there about their lives their histories etc one because like they still got to live a long time and you don't want your business all out there i get mm-hmm. it like that's reasonable like you have a lot of life to go <laughs> and like why i'm not going to tell everyone my entire life story either like it'd be weird so i get it uh but <laughs> with that being said like as thorough as I would love to be in this, I don't have all of the information. There were like gaps and stuff like that. So I just kind of pieced together a lot of different interviews and I highly recommend reading these interviews because they're really interesting and we have them in our blog. Um, but yeah, I, I was not able to get as thorough as I think a traditional biography would. Um, but I did find some really interesting things and anecdotes and stories as well as like a lot of words from them, which is, the best way to receive this, I would assume, uh, is just from hearing from them themselves. Um, Spoken by me, uh, but (laughs) their words. Uh, And yeah, they're just super interesting. And I highly recommend checking out a lot of their interviews. Like, even though I haven't read a lot of the books that they're talking about in the interviews, it's all really interesting stuff. So a little background. Sylvia Moreno Garcia was born in Baja, California, Mexico on April 25th, 1981. Her parents both worked at a radio station as journalists, so they've always had a lot of books and, like, writing and literature in the house. They have a family full of storytellers and writers, and Mm -hmm. that's kind of like a generational thing that's pretty cool. Um, Her mother was very into science fiction and fantasy. There were always classics in the house, like Dune and Tolkien. Um, and they also had more modern offers for the time as, uh, I said, they were born in 1981. So her mother had a lot of authors who were coming popular in the 1970s, like Tanith Lee and Anne McCaffrey. Um, and in an LA times article that Gabe showed me, uh, Sylvia mentions that her mom was a sci-fi and horror fan. She read Frank Herbert's Dune, Stephen King, and she had a love affair with HP Lovecraft's work. Um, mm-hmm. 
There are stories she grew up reading as well. Um, These are the stories that she grew up reading as well. And her mother had many books in the house translated from English into Spanish and some in English as well. Sylvia loved books and this love of books and stories was generational as her great grandmother was also an oral storyteller. Um, In the LA Times article that I mentioned, she spoke on the influence of her great grandmother and As she could not read or write, she spoke a lot of her stories, and Sylvia recalls, so for her stories were told, not written, and everything had a place. You couldn't rush my great-grandmother when she was speaking. You let her talk. You trusted her. Um, And Sylvia was very impacted both by the stories that her mother shared with her, but also the stories that her great-grandmother spoke to her um, and said that it really shaped her and her love of storytelling, too. Mm -hmm. Growing up in Mexico, Sylvia learned English from kindergarten on. She noted that there weren't many children's books available specifically in Mexico. Um, And she grew up really immersing herself in like older fiction, like fiction not written necessarily for kids, Uh, specifically The Three Musketeers she read at the age of eight. And this really helped develop her vocabulary at an early age uh, and challenged her uh, in reading like books that for were not written specifically for kids Mm -hmm. um and this influenced her to read so many different books because like it was really just like read whatever you can find that you like and it was she really leaned into that heavy um so she read everything in spanish and in english from the bible to mythology and anything she could get a hold of reading was her passion and she spent a lot of time in a mexican chain bookstore called gandhi bookstore She noted that reading wasn't especially common in her social class growing up as she grew up with not a lot of money. Um, But because her parents are both journalists, they spent money on books and they always had a lot of books in the house. Um, And because of this, a lot of people thought her love of reading was odd, like people like her in her age group. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, books were the main thing that her family would end up spending money on. And luckily, a lot of the older books were inexpensive. Um, When they were young, they were very impacted by the short stories of Edgar Allan Poe, and this was one of their first introductions into horror literature. After Poe, they discovered H.P. Lovecraft, and that is something that deeply impacted their life. Uh, In fact, they even said, like, of the people, if they could, like, meet anyone who was dead, who was a writer, they would want to, like, meet H.P. Lovecraft uh, and, like, show them things from modern times Mm -hmm. (laughs) to be like, what do you think of this? What would that be about? Um, Yeah. But yeah, so this love of the works of H.P. Lovecraft deeply impacted her life. uh, And they went on to write their master's thesis, as I said, on eugenics, women, and Lovecraft. Uh, They eventually also edited anthologies inspired by Lovecraft stories and also like made it a point to really seek out to rewrite a lot of the narratives in there uh, and like make them her own. Uh, Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they read as much as they possibly could across genres, fiction and nonfiction. Whenever they could read, they would read. Um, and while reading was her passion, writing became her passion as well out of like financial necessity. They spent a lot of time in school and don't mention that leading to much, if any, financial prosperity. Um, they got a bachelor's degree in the States. And in 2004, they moved to Canada to get their master's degree, as stated above. Um, it seemed that a lot of their motivation came from loving learning and wanting to learn as much as possible as a way to make sense of the world. And not like originally, like a lot of her schooling kind of oriented around things she was just really interested in Mm -hmm. Um, and not really to get money. But what happened as a result of that, which I can relate to that because I did the same thing. I was like, I just want to learn stuff so that the world makes sense. And so things don't feel as crappy. And then I was like, wow, that degree got me nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Who's going to pay me money to talk about history if I don't have a teaching degree? Yeah. Um, so she ended up facing something similar in that she graduated and the job offers didn't just come pouring in. Uh, as I said, growing up, they didn't have a lot of money. And the need of money is kind of what really influenced their branch into writing because it was like a way to kind of gain financial independence. Uh, They even go as far to say that writing was their only marketable skill. Uh, So they got into writing because it was the only thing that they could think of that could make money to help their family. Um, In an interview on Locust Mag, they say, I started writing fiction because I needed money and I was depressed. I wrote King of Sand and Stormy Seas and ended up selling it to Shimmer. And that was one of the first stories I sold. 
after that, I realized I could sell and that maybe I did have a marketable skill. We had immigrated to Canada. My husband was working two jobs. I had a baby and I couldn't get full-time work. I was doing journalism for this weekly rag writing stories, like $40 a pop. Sometimes they wouldn't pay with cash. They would just pay with food coupons to a bar where I would take my baby and eat. Mm -hmm. My mother was sending money for Mexico, which was very shameful. You move to another country to make a better life, and then your mother sends you 100 bucks so you can cover the rent. We were burning through our savings, so I was just in a really lousy place. Then I sold the story, and I thought, I can do it. The good thing about commercial speculative fiction, as opposed to literally literary fiction, is that markets tend to reply fast and they tend to pay. They may not pay much, but at the time, getting twenty or thirty dollars was big, and I could write with a baby on my lap. I was doing freelance journalism anyway, so fiction was just one more thing I could do, and then at least I would feel like I w- I wouldn't feel so horrible, like a POS loser. You graduate magna cum laude and everyone says, you're going to be great. I'm going to the States with a scholarship. I was supposed to be the smart person. And then you live in a horrible place and you've got no money. I was hanging out with a baby all day and wondering what happened. My friends were doing great things. And I was like, how did I end up here? So writing stories made me feel better. And because somebody appreciated it, it, because somebody finally like appreciated what I was doing and it brought in a trickle of cash. Then I got a job, a horrible full-time job. I was working in video production and it was terrible. (laughs) Minimum wage and soul destroying. I got a better job doing communications in an office and things were economically stable, but I kept doing the short story thing because I had gotten used to it. I could crank them out. When you're a journalist, there's a deadline. A lot of times writers talk about, oh, writer's block. And I'm like, that's bananas. If you're in journalism and there's a 5 p.m. deadline and you don't have your copy done, you're fired. I come from that mentality. Even with a full-time job, if I had an hour in a day, I could crank out a story in a couple of weeks. It's just a process. It's not magic. I had a friend who was studying creative writing and she was writing one story a year. (laughs) She was done with her degree. She had two or three stories, like 5,000 words each. That's ridiculous. You need to exercise your writing muscles. That's the only way you to get better is to write. Um, so I just thought that like that's amazing. That was a really cool story. Um, and it was cool. Like I was like, that is a long quote, but all of that is super interesting. So it needs to go in here. Um, and essentially, like that experience really shaped like her creating spaces for people to write mm-hmm. and creating this more spaces like for herself to write and her like people people to write. So they worked with their friend, Paula Stiles, uh, who was also living in Vancouver and they were looking at gaps in the publishing market. And they noticed that it was heavily saturated with white men and very little else. Mm, if there were women, yeah. Right. Oh, what? <laughs> white men doing it. Like yeah. taking over everything, just not letting anybody else do a thing. Um, so weird. Uh, <laughs> so they noticed like, the industry was heavily saturated. If there were women, they were white women. Uh, the industry was missing BIPOC people and women. They looked online and noticed that like there were people writing who wanted to be published within that demographic. And a lot of them, they looked online and noticed there was an internet filled with forums of women who were really into weird fiction, into Lovecraftian horror and other things. Um, There were women who were fans of the genre, and some of them really wanted to write and were already writing, but weren't getting published. Um, Sylvia and Paula came together and realized if they weren't getting published, but had the energy, the skill, and the passion for it, maybe they could create a place for it. Um, They had to make space for them since one didn't exist. So they created Innsmouth Free Publishing. Innsmouth. Innsmouth. Innsmouth Free Press. Uh, And from this idea, they started as a magazine and a small website, but they did have to downscale it at some point because it got like really busy. Um, Mm. And they made several anthologies and books, which resulted in an all women Lovecraft anthology called She Walks in Shadows and ended up winning the World Fantasy Award. They described it as a place for the women men don't see and therefore nobody sees, which is just really awesome that they made this space and that they did so in that it's working, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, they also work to translate works by authors who haven't been translated to help get their work to English reading audiences and to get them more like presence. Mm-hmm. Um, 
in terms of what they've been doing lately, she's been getting published and winning awards, a bunch of them. She's also performing and like doing talks at places. There are so none cool. in Philly. Sad. Mm -hmm. um, but they have some in Chicago, um, a bunch of other places that you can find on their website. Um, Sylvia is an author of a number of critically acclaimed novels, including Gods of Jade and Shadow, that won the Sunburst Award for Excellence in Canadian Literature of the Fantastic, uh, and the Ignite Award. Uh, I think it's Ignite. Ignite, that makes sense, words, you know. <laughs> Ignite Award, um, and Mexican Gothic, which won the Locus Award and the British Fantasy Award, Pacific Northwest Book Award, Aurora Award, Goodreads Award. They won a bunch of awards. Uh, and Velvet Was the Night, which is the finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and has won the B McCavity Award. So we'll be covering a book that wasn't on that list called Certain Dark Things by her next week. And it's one of those, like, needs more attention because it's really interesting. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. only on chapter two. Gabe's read the whole thing and so it's great. So <laughs> I'm going to go off of that. And by next week, I'll have read the whole thing. And I'll probably be like, wow, that was such a great book. Everyone read it. Um, but there, as I said, I read a lot of interviews. And in all of these interviews, she said a ton of just really interesting things that I think people would like to know about. So... Um, in one specific one on pen.org called The Pen 10, an interview with Sylvia Moreno Garcia, written by Jared Jackson. She answers some cool questions, like kind of how I pulled for, I think it was NK, like just from their website of like questions that they've answered many times that mm -hmm. people might find interesting. I kind of just pulled from this specific one because I really liked the questions that the interviewer asked. Um, and I quoted some of them below. Uh, I didn't include all the questions because we'll be covering Mexican Gothic late at a later date. And I didn't want to give accidental spoilers ahead of that content. Um, Got it. and also like go read it because, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, one of the questions was, why does your, what does your creative process look like? How do you maintain momentum and remain inspired? She says, I look at my checking account. <laughs> I know that sounds flippant, but I feel many times you're not supposed to accept the material realities of working in the arts. I like writing, but I also like eating. So I've taught myself to write efficiently within the constraints of my life, which include a day job, a family and stuff like that. The hard part is not inspiration. That's easy. Uh, it's the other stuff that takes a bit of juggling. But I tell writers who are starting out to figure out what their pace is like and stick to it. If you write 500 words a day, Monday to Friday, you'll have a short story in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, what is one book your piece of writing or what is one book or piece of writing you love that readers might not know about? Which I thought was interesting. Um, and they mentioned Thomas P. Cullen who wrote three great novels beginning with the letter B, The Beguiled, The Besieged, and The Bedeviled. Um, and they had to fish the besieged from the vaults of their library, which is interesting. Um, you just can't find it in print, they say. Uh, his other two novels have been recently reissued, and The Besieged is what might be called a pot boiler. It's a multi-point of view novel where every point of view is unreliable. I wish mm -hmm. more people would know Charles Williams, who was a great noir writer and has been oddly forgotten. And not enough of Rolo Diaz's work has been translated. Uh, he's a wonderful noir writer, too. And I think the only book available by him in English is Tequila Blue. I believe Rolo Diaz might be one that they've worked to translate, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so... Don't quote me on it, but uh, they <laughs> have worked to publish uh, lots of writers who don't have their works currently in English. And I think that's one of them. But if not, maybe one day. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to young writers? Read everything. Nonfiction, fiction, memoirs, novellas, pulp, obscure stuff, the canon and the obscure. Writing is a constant conversation with yourself and with literature. You can't have that if you've only tasted one dish. Um, so she kind of like practices what she preaches. She reads everything. So she's saying, if you want to be a good writer too, go do that too. Yeah. Well-rounded. Um, mm -hmm, Cause you're not going to get the full picture from just one variety of stories. Like you really got to read a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Um, as I said, uh, we mentioned before, they really liked, uh, HP Lovecraft's works. So which writer living or dead would you most like to meet? 
what would you like to discuss? I think I'm obliged to say that I'd like to reconstitute Lovecraft using his essential salts. I did my thesis work on him, and I feel in a strange way that I grew up with him. In a way, he was one of my best friends as an awkward kid growing up in Mexico City, which sounds bizarre, but it's true. I don't know, however, how the conversation might go. It would probably be very still, stilted, uh, but for the most part, I'm like a turtle and I don't want to meet anyone. And I just want to live inside my safe, cozy shell. That's why I like the internet. I can internet interact with people without having to let people see me. As for talking, I like to talk about books nobody knows about in old movies. So I'd probably show Lovecraft the movie Get Out and Annihilation and see what he thinks. <laughs> what do you think about Get Out? That's such a good question. <laughs> like, you know what? Yeah. You're right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. You right. Well, yeah. <laughs> and I thought it was like a good combination of things. Get out and annihilation. Both of those movies are entire trips. So yeah. I imagine he would be like, wow. Yeah. Annihilation <laughs> really good for him. Or yeah. like Lovecraft Country. I wonder what he would think of that. Yeah. No, for sure. I bet it would be. <laughs> He'd probably be like, why? Wow. Whoa. But also maybe it would be like maybe in the afterlife. He has gone through something that has maybe made him different. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. We'll never know because that's what happens when people you die. die. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But uh, why do you pe- think people need stories is the last question I'm going to cover that she answers. And she says, humans seem to love explaining the world through narratives. Uh, with many of my characters, I think one of the elements that unites them is that for good or ill, narratives shape them and have a great impact on them. In Gods of Jade and Shadow, my protagonist is on a quest while also understanding that this is a quest. Um, And in Mexican Gothic, Naomi has read Gothic novels. I probably lived my entire youth through books and films. You know that line from Iris, when everything feels like the movies? Well, to me, everything felt like the movies and the books. Mm. Um, So all in all, Sylvia Moreno Garcia is super interesting, hella inspiring, and paving the way for writers who often don't get the recognition, financial backing, etc. that they very much deserve. And I don't know, I'm very much looking forward to reading as much of their books as I can and to take their advice, write stuff, read stuff. Uh, and I recommend you do the same. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. That's so true. That, that's like the, the rule that every writer says, like when you're like, how mm-hmm. do you, they're like, you just write, you just do yeah. it. Even if <laughs> you can't yeah, get better unless it. you do and it. I'm like, you know, honestly, yeah. <laughs> just like take a minute and just write a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> maybe we can both start doing that game every day. We yeah. just write. And even if it's horrible, we'll be like, all right, but it's there. Yeah. I mean, you can't get better unless you are horrible first. Like, yeah, no one starts out with the final draft. Like, you got to start somewhere. And like, yeah. that's what, you know, as a production consultant, that's what I'm telling people all the time. <laughs> it's constant. Just me yeah. being like, you got to do it. Like, how do you expect it to get any better? Yeah, I, I mean, I was at that random <laughs> with my friend Jess. We went to see Neil Gaiman speak, which I didn't ever think of doing until that moment. But we went and I was like, all right. And what he said was that your first novel is going to be trash. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to be a pile of garbage. So if you stop there and wait to get that published, you're never going to get published. Just keep writing stuff. Your first novel is not going to be the best. You're going to go back and read it because he even said that about his first novel. He's like, I went back and read that and it was garbage. <laughs> in fact i thought that was good horrifying i hide it in my attic and it's never coming out like you're never gonna see that novel unless yeah. i'm dead and someone has gone up there and taken it yeah um so you're yeah. just right even if it's bad and it's gonna be um and if you're like writing like, don't stop oh my god right oh, well, like, like, a podcast, you know? yeah no one's allowed to listen to that one so yeah and honestly, I had not listened to podcasts, so I shouldn't have been making one. And now I do a little bit more, so maybe that's why we got better. Yeah. Because <laughs> you were just, like, doing it. I mean, we were both bad, but you were better than me. <laughs> I was just how you learn. You got to learn. <laughs> okay. So why don't I tell us about do it. work? Say stuff. And what it's about. So I um, <laughs> just wanted to start with saying I love Sylvia Moreno Garcia's work. Um, the Our writer series, we, we meant to do one last year because um, mm-hmm. we generally do one like once a year because people really love when we do like bio, 
autobiographical episodes. Yeah, people um, like really come through for those. <laughs> they love those. And uh, it was a different uh, group of writers, but Sylvia was on both lists. Like when we mm-hmm. changed it, she was still there because I was like, no. <laughs> we need to talk about Sylvia. Um, and I have currently read three of her novels so far and I'm working on a fourth one, uh, getting through it. And, um, Mm -hmm. each of them is really phenomenal, like an entrancing piece of literature and no two are the same. (laughs) There might be like some similar things, but, uh, what I really appreciate about Miranda Garcia's work is that you never know what you're going to get when you pick up one of her books, not fully. Um, and she crosses genres so fluidly with extreme care for each of them. Like, mm-hmm. I don't ever feel like she's disingenuous with her approach to them. Whereas, like, there are some writers who, like, switch up what they're doing. And I'm like, you're just be like you don't respect the genre. <laughs> you yeah. know, like just like, it's almost like you're making fun of the genre. Um, mm-hmm. There's a specific author that I think of when I do that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, one, maybe one day I'll roast them. Um, <laughs> book talk. I get really close all the time. Um, but there is an appreciation for the genre with her. And also um, there's this magic that is really only hers. There's a very specific um, tone and feeling that you get with each one of her works that I feel like, um, that's what kind of blends them all together. You know, you're reading Sylvia. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you just get that feeling. Um, yeah. Gods of Jade and Shadow is my favorite. It's a brilliant folktale journey that was hypnotizing and the world was addictive. Um, it was the second one I read by her and I was like, whoa, what? <laughs> like, this is, <laughs> what is this? Oh my yeah. gosh. Like it's, it's one of my favorite books of all time um, for mm-hmm. a lot of reasons. It's just so beautiful. There's a lot. Um, And I really appreciate Sylvia's knack for creating protagonists that are flawed, simple, and beautiful. Um, And she explained in in, in that interview with Penn.org that Kat shared with me her love for the absurd genre work, saying, I love genre fiction and I love horror. Poor horror gets treated like the cousin we don't talk about. He doesn't get invited to dinner. On the one hand, I joke that the industry gave us crabs, the human sacrifice. Please look up the 1988 cover of that book. (laughs) Can't be taken very seriously after going there. (laughs) And the horror boom of the 80s produced plenty of dreck. But between possessed children and sewer mutants, there's there's sometimes a space to touch on something special and no less poignant than a realistic drama. It's a space of shadows on the wall that we stared at before we went to sleep when we were children and the frightful darkness around a campfire. Um, Looks like snaps. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So like I said, we won't be uh, discussing Mexican Gothic in next week's episode. That was like our original thing. And then I was like, let's pivot, but we will talk about Mexican Gothic for sure at some point. um, Cause it's one I really love. And uh, it was my introduction to her and I'm sure introduction for a lot of people um it was also my introduction to book of the month and my wallet has yet to forgive me um, <laughs> it was like oh. and it lives at my house right now yeah <laughs> no, it's okay. um and I have so many books on the tbr now be on my like physical books because of book of the month but it's fine um I had actually found Mexican gothic while doing a deep dive into gothic literature um Mm -hmm. I had been planning to write a script and still am uh in that genre and so I wanted to submerge myself into literary works to get into the right mindset kind of like she was saying like reading all the things Mm -hmm. (laughs) so you can do it justice I was like let me just like identify what the core parts of gothic literature were um and that's when i discovered um mexican gothic because i found that the genre was ripe with classic tales of white women woes and i wasn't entirely interested yeah (laughs) like i was like i found crimson peak by guillermo and i was like that's it this is what Mm -hmm. i got um so when i was knee deep in these searches for gothic tales with any amount of melanin i found mexican gothic Mm -hmm. um and while reading it i fell right into the story it was simple at first, um, so much like other gothic tales. Like she was saying, like, it's aware. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very aware. Like, I am a gothic tale. Um, and I feel like that adds to it. Like, it makes it um, kind of like you're in on the joke mm-hmm. in a way. Um, and it was really intriguing in a way that I couldn't find in others. And I found myself caring more for Noemi than I ever could care for Rebecca. <laughs> like, I was like, oh. 
there's a different there's a different moral that we're getting from yeah. white women led gothic tale and then noemi here um but there was one moment that struck me and had me rethinking my entire reading journey like of my life <laughs> like i was saying like what good reads and everything and that was that in the book um noemi who's our protagonist is a young mexican woman with a wild streak um this takes place in the 50s and she loves dancing she's proud of her sexuality there's like she's wonderful mm-hmm. <laughs> she's just, you know a, a different woman of the time right <laughs> And she is sent on a mission, so to speak. Uh, She is tasked with checking on her cousin, Catalina, who is married to a wealthy white man. Um, And something has happened to Catalina. Her letters are full of mad spirals and ramblings. And when Noemi arrives by train to her destination, a man who works for the estate is there to pick her up. And Noemi, upon seeing this man for the first time, remarks at how absolutely pale he is. Um, (laughs) as As if he had never seen the sun. She's like... (laughs) <laughs> what what is wrong with him like it's how even be this it's just so funny like it's just like are you okay like it's very it's hilarious and it was at that moment that it like dawned on me that noemi isn't white like of course i knew she wasn't but i had been so used to like doing the work on my own and swapping the identity of the characters to fit my experience that it struck me to realize that I didn't have to do that already. <laughs> like Noemi already looked like me. Mm-hmm. And then I had to reckon with all of the other tales that I've read and ponder how many times I'd simply ignored character descriptions, making them up as I wanted to be, them to be. And with Moreno Garcia's work, I never have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoa, that's so cool <laughs> it's like oh my god. it really was i was like oh my god i've been like i've had to do all this extra work um yeah and i don't have to do that <laughs> with this yeah. one um on twitter moreno garcia explained her decision to feature dark-skinned women front and center in her work as a direct critique of colorism in mexico um it's colorism that exists uh in other latin spaces too puerto rico has that as well i grew up having that kind of internalized uh, hatred <laughs> and like racism that comes with that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Marino Garcia said, the women in several of my books are dark and beautiful because my mother was told she was ugly due to her dark skin and indigenous heritage. It's a gift to my mother each time she can picture herself as the hero, um, which is just so beautiful. <laughs> it's like really is. Yeah. Um, in Gods of Jade and Shadow, this critique is really strong and imperative to the story. Like, I think if you know, there's a gift to her mother as a hero, then God's a Jade and Shadow, that's her mom. <laughs> like, it's very obvious, like, this is for you, mom. Um, though each of her books are different, embodying whichever genre and subgenre combinations she fancies at the time, there are pieces that she brings with her to each adventure. And that would be strong Mexican women as protagonists, an entanglement of magic and the very real relatable struggles of those protagonists, uh, simple and honest romances uh, that pilot the journey, mm-hmm. and uh, always there's a vision of Mexico and whether that is uh, a near future, a neo-noir fantastical twenties or the toxic colonized fifties mm-hmm. is Mexico. <laughs> um, I am not Mexican, uh, but it does seem many of my core memories of acceptance and understanding myself have often been inspired by Mexican women. Um, they take up a lot of space in the media world Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's like music movies books uh looking at you selena quintanilla (laughs) i was like that's my childhood um so i just wanted to say how thankful i am that sylvia moreno garcia is in this space spinning wondrous tales of heroic and beautiful protagonists that look like me uh i am also eternally grateful to have the opportunity to learn about Mexican folktale, uh, the indigenous experiences, and more through each one of her books. It's a breath of fresh air, and I'm addicted to the stories and history, and it's like, it's so good to not have just, like, the three <laughs> stories that you always hear, like, we forget, like, the world is so large. Yeah. <laughs> Why would we not talk about the other ones? Um so let me hop into um, bits about her her books, and you'll see exactly what I was talking about when I say, like, they're so different. Um, yeah. So her debut novel, Sig- uh, novel, Signal to Noise, is an urban fantasy novel about a teen girl in 1988 who discovers how to cast spells using magic or using music. 
Um, her and her friends use the, the magic to repair broken relationships, families, and hearts. And the novel begins with Mesh, uh, Meshi, the young girl now older, returning to her hometown to attend her father's funeral. Here she revisits her childhood, the places, people, and the magic. And I'm currently reading that one. Nice. Um, and it was like... it. I had been reading it and then we swapped out for certain dark things. Uh Um, So it was like my third one reading it. I was like, this one is so, it's like, what is this one now? Like, yeah. To go from Gothic to Gods of Jane and Shadow to this, I was like, what? Um, And that was like really exciting to me. It wasn't like a negative. It was just like, that's because I didn't read anything about Signal to Noise. I was just, I'm going to pick this up. And I was like, oh, every time it's something cool. (laughs) Her second novel, Certain Dark Things, we will cover in depth next week. And that is a neo-noir vampire tale set in an alternative Mexico City. And I will geek out much more next week, but this book was so exciting and captivating. Um, I was like raving to Kat. We actually switched over to this for Mexican Gothic because of N.K. Jemisin's review. Mm -hmm. Um, But so many of her books, like I was looking at them and their reviews... And, like, recommendations are from, like, all these other authors that I really love. And I was, like, oh, support. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So that's really cool. But Moreno Garcia envisions a world where vampires live amongst us. And even more interesting, uh, there are different species of vampires. From the native Mexican vampires inspiring visions of gods and bountiful earth to the sickening, pale colonizer vampires that serve as our villain. It's not subtle, and it's great. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Published in 2016, I am so envious of the young people who get to experience this novel in their foundational years. All I had was Twilight and Holly Black, um, and (laughs) like I said, I was looking at Goodreads, and there was like all these other ones where um, those were what I had to satisfy my supernatural literature cravings and what I would not give for the representation, the world building, and the education. Yeah. Like my storytelling would have been so profoundly different had I had the inspiration for that. Um, In an an article on LA Times titled How Silvia Moreno-Garcia's Shapeshifting Visions of Mexico Took Over the Best Sellers List by Paula Woods, they explain how appreciative readers are of her honest and magical world building, saying, science fiction critic Amal L. uh, Motar hailed the novel for its representation of Mexico City as a real place. A city with history, districts, subways, with beautiful, with beauty and ugliness, with problems. It is not a book that renders Mexico City a, according to its distance from New York City or even from the United States. This book's face is turned towards Guatemala, Cuba, and Brazil. Um, and it's so true. Like, <laughs> this character's like on the run, and their answer is like, I don't want to go to America. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't want to go there. Uh, they're like, you could do that. Like, you know, risk yourself with the coyotes. And she's like, nah, yeah. <laughs> nah, I'm going to go south. Um, Mexican Gothic is a terrifi- terrifying novel that gets under your skin. Um, it plays into a very specific fear that I have, but I will not spoil it. Yeah. <laughs> you have listened to this podcast you might know um it plays with magical realism leaving readers with a blend of a logical scientific answer and a haunting mystical one which i love um we're gonna be talking about beloved later in (laughs) in our next series i'm so excited i love magical realism um our protagonists fight for her life against racism colonialism eugenics and mysticism most people know her for this work and can often be caught off guard when reading her other books expecting something equally spooky but marina garcia is a chameleon molding her voice to reflect the genre of choices background flawlessly and with respect um, the only threads that connect them is in uh, intense lo- uh, love and appreciation for her homeland, Mexico, uh, relatable and realistic protagonists, and an intense hate for colonialism. And it's like, girl, same. <laughs> <laughs> I got so excited when it, she was like, and then the colonial vampire. I was like, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I was like, yes. It just She just says it. Like, every single time, she's like, these are the bad guys. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, very NK Jameson. Yeah. <laughs> in, that, in, that um, in that interview with Penn.org, they explained some of the depth with Mexican Gothic. The novel, set in mid century Mexico, not only utilizes the tools of Gothic horror to unsettle and surprise the reader, but to also examine the worst and most fearful truths of society. 
In Mexican Gothic, this includes the racist ideologies and theories of eugenics. If we were to call this genre fiction, what are its inherent strengths? At its best, what can it reveal about society because of its specific rules and demands? Um, so think about that and then go read it. <laughs> it's uh -huh. really quick. Too. Like you could get in and out. Um, Gods of Jade and Shadow, like I said, is my favorite <laughs> so far. Um, it is a gripping journey full of magic, repression, and rebellion. It is familial trauma, internalized racism, and the deconstructing of both. Akin to Cinderella, protagonist Cassiopeia finds herself serving a family that does not serve her. One night, while cleaning her grandfather's office, she encounters an old box, and like Aladdin, she unleashes something otherworldly. She frees the spirit of the Mayan god of death who requests her help in recovering his throne from his treacherous brother. Um, and it is romantic. <laughs> it is mesmerizing because uh, mm -hmm. it's the twenties, And so it's like, aesthetically, it's so beautiful. And there's so much talk about like the differences between like the indigenous people um, and how they're treated and like her, she's literally on a journey. Like she was saying, <laughs> she mm -hmm. knows she's on a journey. She has read fantasy like uh, Cassiopeia and is actively living one of those and it's so cool and honestly again so romantic like there's parts like emotionally and like mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so good that was like favorite one of my favorite books of all time um but on my tbr shelf sits all of her other books, which was Velvet Was the Night, which is a dramatic neo-noir set in 1970s Mexico City during the Dirty War. The daughter of Dr. Moreau is reframing the H.G. Wells story of human-animal hybrids into an anti-colonial adventure set in the Yucatan Peninsula full of romance and suspense. The Return of the Sorceress is a fantasy novel about a broken-hearted sorceress on a path to revenge and power. Prime Meridian is a futuristic tale about a girl working as a rent-a-friend, selling her blood to rich old folks who use it for rejuvenation and dreaming mm. of Mars. Um, the Beautiful Ones is a telekinetic fairy tale, gothic Bridgerton-esque tale of high society mysticism and, as always, love. Untamed Shore, <laughs> published in 2020, is a crime noir featuring a Bonnie and Clyde-inspired couple, murder, and romance. And then there are also 70-plus short stories I couldn't even begin to recite, and I implore you to pick up a Moreno Garcia novel. You will not be disappointed, and further, you will not know what to expect. Yeah. Every time I was, like, writing, <laughs> it was like, and another one, and another, and I was like, what is <laughs> Yeah. And I... Yeah, and then I was like clicking on them and they were already on my like want to read. <laughs> I'm like, I don't got time. Why are you all writing so much? And it's because they're chasing a bag. I get it. Yeah. You're about to have me like unearth my like teenage Goodreads account from my Facebook <laughs> profile and like start using it. <laughs> yeah. Do it. <laughs> to make me put everything that all these people that were learning about ever wrote and just be like, read everything always. So it can put on internet and review it and tell other yeah. people how great it is. Yeah. I'm working on some book docs. So don't I'm going to have a TBR just... now. I'm going to do it. I'm going to have a TBR. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I will share a picture. Challenge accepted. Of a stack of books next to my bed that I just like, I keep, I'll like buy a new book. <laughs> my partner's like, what is that? And I'm like, I have like three of them. I'm like, shh. And then I just put them on top of the pile. <laughs> and sometimes every now and again, I pick one from there. <laughs> yeah. But even in me reading like three books at a, at a time, still can't read them all. Can't read them all. Yeah. I, I can't read paper books, but I want to own them so that when I have kids, they can read them maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, so that their house is filled with books that are not age appropriate for them to read and like learn about stuff and have really interesting worldviews. So yeah. I, I am moving soon and every single time I move, that's the thing I dread is like, I know, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to change. Like the one thing I hoard books. If I were a dragon, my hoard would not be gold. It would be, yeah. it would be books. I'm not Jeff Bezos. Like, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm hoarding wealth, I'm hoarding literature. Yeah. Um, Actually, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's just yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so many, so many things on my list. Um, one thing about Mexican Gothic, like, I have this, like, uh, one of the 
book covers. Every mm-hmm. time you look at this book, there's a different book cover or art made for this book, and they're all amazing. Like, yeah. every single one, I was like, what? I want that one. Or, like, I just, I have um, certain dark things, uh-huh. and I have, like, this one, which has, like, the girl and the dog, um, yeah. which is purple and visiting what the dog looks like. But there's, an, there's like, two alternative covers. And I'm like, I want the one with the hand on it. That looks cool. Or um, Signal to Noise. <laughs> there's yeah. one where there's like a cassette tape on there. And then there's another one that's, like, uh, pink and, like, cool. I was like, I can't You That's – now I'm like, maybe that's what I'm addicted to as well, is, like, judging a book by its cover because those color covers are really dope. Mm-hmm. Also, the fan art for Mexican Gothic is really great. Yeah. Because it's so easy and fun. And full of horrible things, which are people. <laughs> yeah. People I'm excited people. to read it. It's been in my house for a million years, but I'm probably still not going to read the paper version. And I'm just going to read the internet version. And I'll return good. your precious, precious book back to you. Yeah, and then probably buy it and then never look at it again. But hopefully one day other people will because I have it. Yeah. Oh, the one thing I will note. So, uh, like I said before, uh, Mexican Gothic is why I got Book of the Month. And mm. Mexican Gothic, because of that experience with Noemi looking like me and, like, just the the emotional, <laughs> like, reaction I had with that mm-hmm. realization inspired me that every single time I would get a book of the month, I specifically got it from a BIPOC person. Like, mm-hmm. I refused. Like, I was like, I am not reading one of these white lady beach reads. I'm not doing it. And some mm-hmm. of them were really amazing. Some of them I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like you're killing me um but it, it I will say that it really like forcing myself to do that really expanded um the stories that I could tell it wasn't like I wasn't caught in the same you know like how many times can I read a big little lies <laughs> like, mm-hmm. yeah, and I have I've read many of her books so <laughs> I was like but even as different as they are they are the same because it is this one it's like one type of woman's experience every time mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh yeah I hope that like whichever like there's if there's a you know one of the genre works that you like genres that you like there's probably a book by Sylvia Moreno Garcia in that genre and I encourage you to give it a read and Mm -hmm. it will I think open up the world to you and give you appreciation especially for like Mexico I'm like wow yeah (laughs) like you it's so rich in in history and um we don't really get a lot of that for Puerto Rico and mm-hmm. I'm always looking like I have a book of Puerto Rican folk tales because I'm like, tell me <laughs> um, yeah. but even just learning about Mexico. I'm like, that's amazing. And I could very easily <laughs> do that. <laughs> if you heard that, that was my cat. Um, she also loves Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Yeah. And, she wanted to tell everybody about it. Yeah. It was a good time for her. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are my thoughts. And then yeah, great I, thoughts. Read it, read it. Ten out of ten. Yeah. So. And it, it's like a just great <laughs> mantra to have. Everyone read. Everyone do it because you'll just learn things. You'll get better as like a human. You'll learn about the world. You mm-hmm. wanted the same thought a million times, you know? Yeah, but like, and read a book by like a black woman, mm-hmm. <laughs> an indigenous woman, <laughs> a Mexican, but like, so, or like. A queer like people like I have read so many queer books this year and I am living I'm living mm-hmm. for it. so um yeah <laughs> in our next writer series oh just you wait <laughs> I'm getting in there yeah you're, you're breaking down some boundaries so I'm very mm-hmm. excited um so stay tuned uh definitely check out our episode next week for certain dark things let us know how you feel which one of Sylvia Moreno Garcia books is your favorite and I'm sure we all have a different one it's almost like mm-hmm. It could be a BuzzFeed BuzzFeed quiz. Like, which Sylvia Moreno Garcia book are you? And they're like, are That's you the great. Nora? I think that should exist. Drama? Are you the, you know, H.P. Lovecraft short story? Are you the one about Mars? Like, what are you? Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> let us know. Let us know what your favorite is. Let us know some recommendations. Definitely one of those. If you like Sylvia Moreno Garcia, then you might like. I would love for you to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm currently reading some River Solomon. Recommend some of those. Um, And uh, remember to like and subscribe. Drop us some comments. Let us know what you think, how you feel. Hit the bell. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, a notification. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, check out our our short film Jolly Butcher, which yeah, is in a lot the of its rounds. Time. Yeah, we have now been in four. Well, we're going to be in have been in four film festivals. So yeah, uh, check out our short films. They're like really dope, they're and so they fun. do not get enough love. Yeah, they're just so beautifully shot, and yeah. everyone should watch them. They're and so like, scary. yeah, maybe we don't act great, but like. <laughs> it's worth yeah, it. Well, I, I think we do act pretty well too. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like an Emmy, but it's decent. It doesn't. It's yeah. not going to make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, do all those things uh, and don't get married. They'll eat your kids. <laughs> oh, oh. You're oh, welcome. Oh, why? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know why. But I'm so <laughs> done. <laughs> Do up, do up, don't eat your kids. Uh, yeah. That's <laughs> what we're getting, doing. They're getting weird. All right. Well, we'll see you next week before we go on break, and then we'll see you in the spookiest of months. October. So stay tuned. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.